Hello and welcome to everyone joining us this afternoon. My name is Eugene Reichel and I am director of the Center for East European and Russian Eurasian Studies at the University of Chicago. Today's lecture is part of the Area Studies Showcase Lecture Series on Russia, Eastern Europe and Central Asia. This series is product, uh, presented by the 2018 to 2021 US Department of Education Title VI National Resource Center and Foreign Language and Area Studies grant recipients for Russia, Eastern Europe, and Central Asia. And we want to give a particular thanks to Zachary Kelly and the Institute of Slavic, East European, and Eurasian Studies at the University of California, Berkeley for their initiative in organizing this virtual lecture series. One housekeeping note on Zoom procedure for this afternoon's lecture, please uh, try to use the Q&A box for your questions. You can enter a question at any time, and you can also use that uh, function to upvote questions uh, that you're particularly uh, interested in. Today, I'm delighted to be introducing Faith Hillis, Associate Professor of Russian History and the College here at the University of Chicago. Faith is a historian of modern Russia with a special interest in the intersection of politics, culture, and ideas. She's the recipient of grants from the Kalman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the American Council of Learned Societies. She has also held fellowships at Columbia and Harvard. She's the author of Children of Rus, uh, Right Bank Ukraine, and The Invention of a Russian Nation. Today's lecture is based on her second book, Utopia's Discontents, Russian Emigres and the Quest for Freedom in the 1830s to the 1930s, which is forthcoming with Oxford University Press in 2021. The first comprehensive account of the Russian revolutionary movement abroad, this project traces how the aspirations born of the colonies, as well as the explosive discontents they produced, reimagined radical, radical culture and ideas. In the process, it provides a novel reassessment of the Russian Revolution and of Russia's relations with its European neighbors. Please join me in welcoming Faith Hillis. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for that introduction, Eugene. And I'd also like to thank our wonderful staff of series at the University of Chicago, as well as everyone at the NRCs across the nation who've worked on putting together this wonderful lecture series. Uh, I'm going to share um, my screen now. Hopefully everyone can see it. Um, and thank you as well to everyone who's in attendance today. I'll talk for about 30, 35 minutes, and then we should have ample time for Q&A. The future of humanity once depended on this Geneva brasserie or so it seemed at least to the young people from Russia who frequented the Cafe Landol in the summer of 1903. In a back room, Vladimir Lenin gathered with comrades to build a new Marxist party. While up front, Chaim Weizmann, the future first president of Israel, met with friends to lay plans for a Zionist university that would cultivate the national potential of the Jewish people. The Landol stood at the very heart of Geneva's so-called Russian colony a boisterous community of exiles that incorporated professional revolutionaries representing every leftist party in the Russian empire, as well as nationalists of many stripes, not only Zionists, but also Poles, Armenians, and Ukrainians, among others. The Russian colony in Geneva and Russian colonies in other European cities sheltered several generations of activists and produced most of the illegal literature that circulated in Russia. These were the sites where Russians discovered socialism, anarchism, and Marxism, and they're the place where Bolshevism was born. But the utter dominance of a very traditional brand of high intellectual history in approaching the formation of these ideas means that we actually know very little about the lives of the communities that produced them. Why did Lenin, a Russian Marxist from Siberia, and Weizmann, a Jewish nationalist from Belarus, end up in the same cafe thousands of miles from their respective homes? And what were the results of the encounters that occurred at the Cafe Landol and other places like it? These are the central questions that my book grapples with, trying to produce the first synthetic account of radical exile life over the last years of the czarist regime. I argue that the Russian colonies should be seen as utopian communities whose improvised nature allowed residents to build the world that they wanted to see. 
And I want to emphasize here that when I, I'm talking about utopia, I'm not using this term to suggest that it's a quixotic or an impossible goal. And in fact, quite the contrary, following the Marxist theorist Ernst Bloch, I'm interested in thinking through how the idea, how the dream of a perfect world actually becomes inscribed in the lives of living communities. I show how colony life afforded emigres the opportunity to liberate themselves from the bonds that had oppressed them in Russia and to evolve from merely dreaming about the revolution to actually living the revolution. It turns out that through living revolutionary lifestyles and creating these radical communities abroad, emigres actually managed to prefigure the better world of the future of which they dream to, to sort of bring it to life in reality. So this is an argument that's trying to broaden the purview of intellectual history, thinking about lived experience as a vital aspect of intellectual production. This project is also very much about particular spaces and places. As I'll argue, the peculiar demographics of the colonies, their spatial arrangement, and the contacts that they catalyzed were all crucial in defining their revolutionary potential. So I'm thinking through the way that went in which immigrant politics were very embodied and very experiential. At the same time, the forms of radical praxis that emerged from these communities traveled far beyond their borders. I'll show how experiments born in the colonies made it back to Russia, and I'll identify several junctures at which developments abroad played a crucial role in forging radical thought in the country that the emigres had left behind. In addition to providing a properly transnational account of the Russian Revolution, this book yields new insights into the entanglements between autocratic Russia and liberal Europe. And as I'll show, the colonies left some surprising marks on their European host societies. Above all, this book is an argument for the generative power of the immigre milieu. But as I'm also going to show, the revolutionary visions articulated in the colonies evolved in unexpected and sometimes troubling ways. Ultimately, these communities produced deep discontents that would shape revolutionary culture no less profoundly than their utopian lifestyles. So I'm gonna spend the first part of my talk uh, here to looking at what it means to live the revolution and how these emigres did it. I'm then going to consider the uh, influence of these Russian colonies in shaping politics across borders. And I'm going to close by thinking about the unanticipated results of these utopian experiments and their impact on the Russian revolution. Space and demography played key roles in defining the utopian potential of the Russian colonies. And I spend a great deal of time in the book um, trying to analyze these through a variety of digital techniques. I'm happy to talk about this more in the Q&A if people are interested. The very simple question of who lived where and when was actually very complicated to answer. And that's because almost all of these emigres leave Russia illegally, untracked, and they're also not tracked systematically in their new countries of origin. And so one way that I found of trying to assess the evolution of these places over time was to think about their literary culture. These people were constantly reading and most importantly, publishing works. Um, so the map that you're looking at here is basically showing how many works were produced when in certain places. As you'll see by looking at this map of literary output, by the early 20th century, there were Russian colonies in almost every country in Europe but the most significant centers by far were in the liberal powers of France, England, and Switzerland. And these served as my central archival case studies. Russians flocked to these countries precisely because they provided the most extensive political rights. Almost all czarist subjects who arrived were recognized as refugees. Emigre settlements tended to emerge in inexpensive neighborhoods on urban peripheries. Paris's Russian colony, which you see here, coalesced in the 13th arrondissement around what is now Lego Bolin. In Geneva, we're talking about the southern edge of the city leading up to the suburb of Carouge. And in London, Russians clustered around the British Library, which was a perennial favorite hangout of revolutionaries the world over. Groups that had been particularly disadvantaged in Russia disproportionately flocked abroad. And they used the freedom of these, these new immigrant spaces to liberate themselves. These communities were run by professional revolutionaries who emerged as their moral conscience of sorts. They were also full of self-professed emancipated women who pursued university study abroad. And many come with sort of only quasi developed political ideas but become radicalized uh, while studying overseas. Um, the woman in the foreground actually is a woman named Vera Hatzman who flirts with a variety of Russian radical student clubs be before she sort of lands at the Zionist club and it's there that she will meet her future husband, Heim Weizmann. <laughs> 
Finally, the colonies were what I would call majority minority, which is to say that they were disproportionately populated by Poles, by Ukrainians, by Georgians, by Armenians, and Jews. So these are people of the borderlands, essentially. So I need to underline that when I'm using the term Russian here, I'm not using it in an ethnic sense. Rather, I'm using it to refer to people from the Russian Empire. All of these groups, revolutionaries, women, and national minorities, use the freedom of these communities to pursue new political programs. And these were sites of intense political agitation and organizing. But what was most interesting to me as I delved deeper into this project uh, was how actually the social infrastructure of these places not only articulated these revolutionary values, but began to realize them to an extent. Uh, this uh, colony residents built a dense network of communes, of revolutionary courts, of mechanisms to redistribute wealth, self-governance institutions built around the principles of justice and equality. They also founded networks of clubs, coffee houses, libraries, canteens, and a lively periodical press. And you see some of these spaces of importance that I've identified in Paris here. These institutions, which served all colony residents, catalyzed new encounters between men and women from different walks of life. They encouraged residents to build new solidarities and friendships and to contemplate the ways in which their individual hopes and aspirations were in fact connected. National minorities in exile tended not only to seek freedom for their own, they actually began to talk to each other and to explore radical alternatives to imperial rule altogether. So these were spaces in which federalist thought became very, very popular. Similarly, these emancipated women who I mentioned tended not to pursue a project of um, narrow equal rights, and rather they assumed a much more radical project of revolutionizing the social order, in part by practicing free love and by smashing the barriers between the sexes and the classes. So the overarching ethos of these new solidarities was essentially to give voice to the, to the persecuted and to the dispossessed and to create a new society that reflected the things that they cared about. To look at the dynamics of how all of this worked, I want to focus on one particular emancipatory campaign that I see as the most generative of all in these emigre spaces. And this was the campaign for Jewish liberation. Some 60 to 80% of colony res residents were Jewish by origin. And this is precisely because Jews faced such intense repression in Imperial Russia. Resolving what the, the residents of these spaces called the Jewish question became one of the most urgent preoccupations of colony life. And my account places this center, this, this, sorry, this Jewish question really at the center of Russian revolutionary history. But of course, from the very beginning, there was great disagreement about how this goal should be accomplished. Some residents of Jewish origin gravitated to Marxism. They included Pavel Axelrod and Rosa Luxemburg, early and influential Marxist theorists. Stringent universalists, Marxists insisted that the liberation of any particular group necessarily ran by way of social revolution. As Axelrod put it, quote, there is no Jewish question, only the social question. Zionism, which tended to see particularism instead of universalism as the solution to the Jewish question also flourished in the hothouse of these spaces. Zionists waged fierce political debates with these universalist Marxists in the colonies. Uh, one at which speakers competed for the loyalty of Jewish students in Bern stretched over some 60 nights ending, um, some of these nights ending in, in fist fights, incidentally. But amidst this history of enmity also lurks an interesting one of interconnection and influence. Indeed, several major Zionists who were not Marxists, including Weizmann, whom you see pictured here, and Vladimir Jabotinsky, talk about how it was precisely their encounters with Jewish Marxists in the small claustrophobic spaces of these colonies that actually consolidated their national convictions. And so I'm looking at the ways in which these seemingly opposing ideologies actually need each other. They're mutually constitutive. The encounters that occurred in the colonies played a crucial role in shaping a third political alternative that moved between these two poles. And this is one that I might call Jewish socialism. This path was first defined by a now obscure figure named Aaron Lieberman, who you see pictured here. A former rabbinical student, Lieberman fell in with a group that revolved around the Russian socialist Pyotr Lavrov in London in the 1870s. Lieberman challenged very long traditions of anti-Semitism in Russian radical thought, urging Russian socialists to engage more with Jewish, Jewish issues and to recruit more Jews into their movement. Indeed, he argued that Jews as the most oppressed people of the Russian empire by virtue of their religion and their ethnicity and their class 
were therefore the ideal revolutionaries. As these debates continued, a new wave of migration began that transformed the nature of these arguments. And here I'm moving back to this theme of uh, the importance of encounters and of lived experience. In the 1880s, Jewish proletarians began to flee Russia en masse. In contrast to the residents of the colonies, most of these travelers were not intellectuals with university educations, but were rather deeply religious Yiddish speaking Jews. Most actually didn't even identify with Russia, wouldn't have thought of themselves as Russians, but instead identified with their city or region of origin. Most of these travelers settled in London and Paris, although of course many more move on to the Americas. And uh, those who settled in London and Paris mostly found work in the artisanal trades and in sweatshops. Although these cities hosted large Russian colonies, these newcomers tended not to settle there. And this is another sign of the distinctiveness of this proletarian migration. Instead, the newcomers gravitated to neighborhoods uh, with long Jewish histories. So these included the East End in London and the Marais in, in Paris, which you see pictured here. Aaron Lieberman, that revolutionary who had already committed himself to engaging Jews in the larger Russian radical movement, immediately gravitated to these Jewish proletarians who now turned up in his home city of London. And his encounters with these proletarians encouraged his brand of Jewish socialism he was developing to develop in new directions. He observed that Jewish workers who suffered from poverty and persecution in Russia now faced new forms of exploitation at the hands of developed capitalism in the West. And according to Lieberman, this experience of universal persecution across these many different national contexts made Russian Jewish proletarians the ideal people to lead not only a Russian revolutionary struggle, but a truly global struggle for the emancipation of all peoples. Lieberman thus argued that the particular experience of Jewish workers could actually be harnessed in pursuit of this broader universal cause of the liberation of mankind. This insight into how the particular could inform the universal, encouraged Lieberman to adapt a new mobilizational tactic, conducting political agitation in Yiddish. This was at the time a deeply unconventional move since most radical intellectuals, whether Jews or Gentiles, viewed Yiddish as a jargon unbefitted to discussing high culture or important ideas. Lieberman succeeded in organizing the world's first Yiddish speaking workers union in the late 70s. And by the 1880s, young Jewish intellectuals inspired by his work began flooding into the East End, where they re uh, created the world's first Yiddish radical newspapers, as well as a series of clubs and reading rooms, very much like those that had earlier emerged in the Russian colonies. Um, and the most famous of these institutions is pictured here, uh, the Burner Street Club um, in East London. Unfortunately, it no longer exists. These institutions carried on the task of translating the concerns of Russian and Russified revolutionaries to this new Jewish immigrant workforce. And this happened on both a literal and a metaphorical level. This happened on a literal level when revolutionaries hired under and unemployed Jewish workers to translate the Russian revolutionary classics into the Yiddish language. And this process of translation happened on a metaphorical level when radicals began encouraging this immigrant workforce to see the revolutionary politics and revolutionary solutions of the Russian colonies as the solution to the workers' everyday trivies. Um, so for example, this is from one of these very early Yiddish newspapers and this little illustration and headline here is explaining the Paris Commune to workers in simple language and basically saying, you know, if you're a sweatshop worker, here's why you should care about the Paris Commune and here's why you should join its revolutionary tradition. By the late 80s, these organizing efforts yielded their first fruit. These Yiddish speaking labor unions in London staged their first successful strike against employers. The revolutionary movement that had coalesced in London was the product of encounters between professional revolutionaries and Jewish proletarians that defied both class and linguistic boundaries. It harnessed particular experiences of Jews as well as particular Jewish cultural traditions, the Yiddish language, in service of the universal emancipation of mankind via the liberation of labor. Word of these accomplishments and also these many publications produced in London rapidly circulated around the world. London organizers worked in close connection with activists in both New York and Paris, as well as um, other places to which um, Jews ended up migrating. And they exported the tactics and the publications that they had first pioneered in London. Uh, and so now I'm going back to this original data that I showed you about publications produced, um, but here sorted by language. 
And you're going to see that Yiddish here shown in yellow becomes a huge part of the literary production that is produced by this Russian radical um, public sphere abroad. The rapprochement between Jewish proletarians and Russified intellectuals was extremely consequential for all segments of the immigration. Marxists as well as non-Marxist parties, socialist revolutionaries, anarchists, and others began moving into these Jewish proletarian districts to found their own Yiddish language newspapers, clubs, so on and so forth. And this wonderful picture that I found in the archives in Paris is of the, one of these Yiddish speaking anarchist groups that's arrested at this point. Gradually, proletarian Jews who had been so dispossessed in their homeland became vital participants of and even leaders in the Russian revolutionary movement. Um, so in essence, I'm, I'm arguing that these Jewish proletarian migrants were actually sort of rustified abroad. I have astonishing examples of sweated workers in London and Paris appearing at mass meetings, proclaiming their willingness to return to Russia and to die for the revolutionary cause there. And in the process, the nature of immigrant neighborhoods themselves begins to change as well. In London, the traditionally Jewish neighborhood of the East End becomes the new center for Russian radical life, drawing in, again, Gentiles as well as Jews who are coming from Russia. And for many, this development was actually the greatest sign yet of the promise of these immigrant communities to overcome ethnic, ethnic, linguistic, and class differences and to join all men and women in common cause. Now, the politics that emerged from the colonies were intimately tied to this dense space that they occupied, as well as the encounters that had occurred between these very diverse residents. But they also had a profound effect on the world beyond their borders. And here I'm moving into the second part of the talk. Although these emigre settlements were isolated and far flung, the circulation of texts and peoples between them knitted them into a single communicative space. Libraries in different cities exchanged texts. Mutual aid organizations emerged that claimed to speak for the immigration as a whole. Meanwhile, colony residents maintained connections with Russia through intricate smuggling networks, some of which I've been able to map here. These spirited tens of thousands of illegal publications into the empire every year, and tens of thousands of dissidents out to live in these colonies. So I'm arguing that um, colony residents are not only imagining this world without borders, they're actually constructing it and living in it. Already by the 70s and 80s, these networks are having a profound effect on Russian radicalism. And I connect these very specific kinds of foreign organizing that are happening abroad to particular moments and movements in Russian history, including, for example, the emergence of the populist movement in the 1870s, very clearly connected to events in Zurich. Uh, but of all these movements created abroad, this unique brand of Yiddish socialism that emerges in London has the most profound impact on Russia of all. In the 1890s, the city of Vilna gives rise to a new Yiddish socialist movement infused by a democratic spirit. And this eventually evolves into the Jewish labor boon, which becomes one of the first organized Marxist parties in Russia. The foundation of the boon is usually approached as a purely domestic story. But I argue that emigre publications and returned activists actually play a crucial role in this process. The Bund quickly became the largest party in Russia. And for a few years, it even served as the motive force of Russian Marxism. Indeed, in 1898, Bund activists played the catalytic role in the creation of the Russian Social Democratic Workers' Party, the first all-imperial Marxist party. The colony's knack for harnessing the particular in service of the universal uh, thus becomes visible again here. We see how cultures that come out of this very specific emigre milieu have a much broader import and how Jewish socialism is rapidly becoming a constitutive element of Russian Marxism. The colony's reputation for living the revolution also had profound effects on European host societies. Russian immigrants were vital participants in almost all of the freedom struggles that occurred in 19th century Europe. It is well known, of course, that Russians played prominent roles in the creation of the international left and the formation of the second international. But what is less well known is that these activists mingled with Irish, Persian, and Indian nationalists living in European exile who came to see Russians as heroes in a struggle of subaltern populations against exploitative imperial powers. And I'm able actually to trace in the book how each of these movements connected with and drew inspiration from these Russians. Russians also played a crucial role in the struggle for women's rights. There were very strong connections, for example, between the British suffragettes who, and these Russians, who, and the, the suffragettes actually appear to have gotten the idea of the hunger strike, which they used uh, to, with such success from the Russians who had first pioneered this tactic in Siberian labor camps. 
Interestingly, all of these emancipatory movements, the international left, anti-colonial movements, feminists, all paid particular attention to these accomplishments of Russian Jews in immigration. For them, it symbolized the capacity of the most weak and the most disempowered populations to triumph over the powerful. And this is obviously very symbolically important for these, these other groups interested in what liberation means. So these relationships between Russians and foreigners engaged in their own quest for freedom added to the utopian enactment that happened in the colonies. They enhanced the colony's reputation as spaces in which the powerless had been able to create new societies that operated on their own terms and in which borders had become meaningless and systems of oppression were obliterated. However, the power of these lived utopias proved extremely facile. And that's because the very elements that imbued many of that imbued these communities with their revolutionary promise also seriously undermined their potential. The intimacy and solidarity of colony life bred devastating co conflicts that tended to marry ideology and personal jealousies. The intimacy and solidarity of these communities also unwittingly facilitated the work of the Russian secret police or Akhrana, which had uh, quite successfully infiltrated these emigre communities by the 1880s with informants and double agents. By the late 1880s, the Akhrana launched a new kind of attack against the immigration. And this was one that aimed to defame the reputation of these Russians in order to corrode the sympathy that they had traditionally enjoyed from European liberals, as well as the protections they had been granted as refugees. The Akhrana established a press agency that paid off newspaper editors to publish art, uh, to, to paid off newspaper editors to publish articles. And it also embedded its own police uh, department employees at prominent Western newspapers. In addition, this press agency produced dozens of articles and pamphlets of its own that were aimed at Western audiences, some of which you'll see pictured here. Finally, the Russian police engaged in a series of provocations that were designed to produce public panic about the criminal intent of these, these Russians abroad. And they, these agents went so far as to organize bombings and assassinations themselves. Anti-Semitic conspiracy theories played a crucial element in this public relation campaigns, a campaign against the immigration waged by the Tsar's secret police. So for example, when Jack the Ripper began terrorizing East London in 1888, Akhrana publicists gleefully insisted that the killer was a deranged Russian Jewish anarchist. It didn't help that the body of one of Jack the Ripper's victims was actually found outside that very Burner Street Club on the night that its members had gathered for a mass meeting about the promise of socialism. These stories planted by the Russian secret police were circulated and picked up by Western sources, which began to produce images um, like this, which you see here, obviously invoking this kind of anti-Semitic panic around Jack the Ripper. So what I'm suggesting here is that uh, the Tsarist secret police cannily found a way to turn the colony's struggle for Jewish liberation, such an inspirational element of their work into an Achilles heel. Police meddling reinforced by effective lobbying and press interventions had a consequential impact in transforming European perceptions of the immigration. As I've mentioned, European opinions of Russians tended to be overwhelmingly positive. The latter were almost universally seen as long suffering refugees in the 80s and 90s. And you see this kind of very sympathetic portrayal um, shown here in this Swiss cartoon. By about 1890, though, we begin to see very different depictions of Russians. We see depictions of Russians like this, Russians as terrorists. Um, and sometimes we also see discussion of Russians as parties to some kind of Jewish plot that is intended to destroy Christian society in Russia and in Europe. And major attacks on immigrant legal rights follow these attitudinal shifts that I, I discuss in great detail in the book. These new external pressures that immigrate society faces in this period also intensified its internal discord. And unsurprisingly, again, this Jewish question emerges as one of the issues of greatest contention. That invention of Jewish socialism, which I, I says has, which I said has harnessed the particular in service of the universal had transformed colony life. But it also led to blowback from the stringent universalists among the ranks of the Marxists, some of whom complained that Russian Marxism had in fact become too Jewish. Many of the founding fathers of Russian Marxism, in fact, accused the Bund of trying to hijack the Marxist movement to serve their own selfish interests. 
And these accusations informed by these long histories of, of radical anti-Semitism that I've already mentioned were intensified by these very, very deep personal jealousies instigated by the small spaces of these communities as well as the boom's meteoric rise. To give you just one example, Georgi Plahanov, uh, considered the founding father of Russian Marxism by many, argued the Bund, and I'm quoting here, the Bund was a band of exploiters who abuse Russians. And he went on to say that the Russian Social Democratic Party should be Russian. Axelrod, himself Jewish by birth, warned his comrades to watch their pockets when dealing with the Jews of the Bund. And here we see, I think, the internalization of these um, anti-Semitic canards that it had in fact undergirded the Ahana's propaganda campaigns. So bear in mind, all of these ad hominem attacks are coming from within the ranks of Marxists. And as you would imagine, the polemics between Marxists and Zionists and other, and other nationalist groups are even more intense. These conflicts spread like wildfire, wildfire in the close-knit colonies, destroying longtime relationships. And by the early 20th century, the combination of these deep internal rifts and these new external pressures had taken a toll that was almost too heavy to bear the mood in the colonies turned increasingly dystopian. It's at this point that we get Lenin arriving. Lenin arrives in Europe in 1900, having recently completed his term of Siberian exile. As we all now know, Lenin used his time abroad to embark on a wholesale renovation of Marxist theory. He rejected the Marxist orthodoxy that the revolution would evolve naturally out of social contradictions and insisted that it needed to be incited and guided by the conspiratorial actions of proven cadres. This entire turn of events, again, is usually analyzed from the vantage point of a history of ideas. But Bolshevism, like previous radical movements, was profoundly shaped by the peculiarities of this immigre milieu. Lenin's new revolutionary doctrines responded to the specific challenges that the immigration faced at the turn of the century. He took this universalist Marxist position to new extremes, scathingly rejecting the legitimacy of any discussion of the, of any discussion of the special needs of Jews or also of women, which had also been a big part of this discourse. Lenin also blamed the disorder in the colonies on emigres traditions of freewheeling intimacy and their efforts to pursue emancipation from below. Yet even as he challenged August emigre traditions, he joined prior generations of colony residents in using this improvised space of exile to build a new utopian community of his own. And again, I'm arguing that it's impossible to separate the ideology of Bolshevism from lived experience, that they're mutually constitutive. The Bolsheviks withdrew from the Geneva colony to form their own private district, venturing into the center of Russian Geneva only to conduct agitation and Lenin used the secretive inner sanctum to create the disciplined revolutionary cadres of which he dreamed. The culture of this community was explicitly patriarchal. Lenin's followers described him as a wise and benevolent father who set the party's paths and mediated its internal disputes. And I think you see this idea reflected in this image of the original Bolsheviks. It's, it's no mistake that he's twice as large as his comrades. Patriarchy was also reflected in gender relations. Although the first cohort of Bolsheviks included many married couples, women tended to uh, assume crucial but traditionally feminine roles, such as managing party correspondence or cooking at the Bolshevik canteen. And this was in fact a major retreat from the very public and very political roles that many women had assumed earlier in colony life. Finally, Bolshevik ideology indelibly was indelibly shaped by encounters with non-Bolshevik rivals when they ventured into these Russian colonies to conduct agitation. The Bolsheviks used their very intimate knowledge of other immigrants that they had acquired living in these close quarters abroad to discredit them. For example, Lenin reportedly compiled a dossier on the deviant sexual practices of Geneva's Mensheviks. Here, I assume he's referring to homosexual activity. And he uses this dossier, brings it around Geneva, trying to court fellow immigrants and win them to his team. Lenin also effectively uses this painful Jewish question as a wedge. He smeared the Mensheviks who had by then broken off as a Jewish party, noting that all but one of the central committee uh, members had been, had been born into Jewish families. And he likewise smeared the Bund as a party of self-interested petty traitors. Lenin succeeded in transforming the culture of the colonies, but he left them more divided than ever before. His personalized attacks and provocative denunciations produced utter chaos in these close-knit communities leading to physical violence and the dissolution of friendships and even many marriages. 
It was at this point, for example, that the Zionists who had always acted in immigration within this Russian framework, debating in immigrant taverns, speaking at mass meetings, began to withdraw from the colonies and form their own exclusive networks. And it's also at this point that many decide to go further afield to Palestine. I think there's still a lot of work to be done on how this European experience influenced the future history of Zionism and the foundation of, of Israel, but this is, I think, for someone else to write. Rather than being chastened by these rifts, Lenin encouraged them, welcomed them, even within his own party. Not only in the lead up to the Bolshevik Menshevik split, but actually quite consistently, he preached that schism was necessary to cleanse the party of undercommitted activists and to realize its true revolutionary potential. By 1917, however, Lenin himself was forced to admit that his gamble appeared to have come to naught. In a speech in Zurich, he admitted that his dreams of catalyzing worldwide revolution had failed. His generation, he acknowledged, this is a speech in January 1917, his generation would not live to see the revolution. He only hoped that the Russian youth of Zurich would. Only a few weeks later, to Lenin's surprise more than anyone, a revolution in fact toppled the Tsarist regime back home. And the Bolsheviks immediately scrambled to return home, along with all of their rivals, Bundes, Mensheviks, socialist revolutionaries, anarchists, and everyone else. When Lenin returned to Russia in April 1917, he took his first step on Russian soil in 12 years. But many other returnees had been away much, much longer. In fact, some had been gone since the 1870s. The final chapters of the book ask what happens when we view the 1917 revolution and the early Soviet period, not only as a new beginning, but as a final chapter of this emigre saga. I've argued throughout that emigre politics were inherently improvisational and experiential, defined by the dynamics of particular spaces and the places in which they took shape. And I think it's for this reason that many one-time exiles were just totally unmoored by this new environment that they found in Russia when they returned home. The new newborn mass politics of this huge country in turmoil were just completely unlike anything they had ever experienced in Europe. Lenin, by contrast, barely missed a beat, very quickly adapting to the needs of his new milieu and reframing his platforms accordingly. And I think it was actually this ability to craft ideological programs attuned to their surroundings, which is something that he had mastered in immigration. This was the single most important factor in his victory in 1917. By the spring of 1917, he had effectively embraced the entire utopian legacy of emigre life. And this included, incidentally, many programs that he had vehemently denounced abroad, such as the struggle for Jewish liberation and the struggle for women's liberation, which he, of course, makes into trademark Bolshevik programs. It's at this time that he also adopts these models of revolution from the ground up that anarchists and SRs had been working on abroad. Again, he had, he had spoken very um, critically of them prior to this point. So I show how Lenin's importation of this kind of situational politics helps him to triumph over his non-Bolshevik rivals and how the close bonds formed by elite Bolsheviks overseas assisted their consolidation of the new revolutionary state. However, as much as the Bolsheviks managed to use this emigre experience to their advantage, the discontents imported from exile also played an important role in the party's future development. Lenin's brutal treatment of the Mensheviks and the Bund in the early Soviet years, I think can really only be understood by situating it in this broader context of his long and tortured and very personal history and animosity with the leaders of these parties. Moreover, I think that this explosive history of the Jewish question helps explain why Bolshevik discourse on this issue remained so schizophrenic. Brendan McGeever and Andrew Sloyne, among others, have recently shown how racialized tropes of Jewish perfidy in fact remained a feature of Bolshevik political culture, even as the party ostensibly pursued the goal of Jewish liberation. The final unintended side effect of immigrant history is the role that it played in the conflict between Stalin and the old Bolsheviks, which culminated in the, last, in the mass purges of the latter in the late 1930s. Part of this tension was cultural. As one of the few old Bolshevik elites who did not spend substantial time abroad, Stalin frequently, uh, and quite explicitly, in fact, on several occasions, remarked on the gulf that separated him from former emigres. He accused the latter of elitism, of clannishness, and of dilettantism. But I think that Stalin also understood and feared the imaginative potential of the emigre legacy itself especially as some of Stalin's one-time emigre rivals, including Trotsky, 
fled abroad and reconstituted their pre-revolutionary international networks, which were now working explicitly to undermine the Soviet state. There was a real fear here, I think, that immigrant networks, which had once built an entirely new world abroad and imported it back to Russia, would in fact succeed in doing so again. And here is the final and the most tragic irony of immigrant history that the colony's greatest accomplishments, their ability to transform abstract revolutionary ideas into lived reality, also colluded in the destruction of their one time residents. Thank you. And I, I look forward to taking questions now. So I'll stop the share. Thank you so much, Faith, uh, for that fascinating uh, talk. Uh, we have a number of questions already that have been put into the Q&A um, and people can continue putting them in. We have a little bit over 15 minutes and we'll try to get through as many as we can. Uh, so Matthew Light asks, uh, you mentioned uh, that most of these emigres left the Russian empire unlawfully. Could you please tell us a bit more about the restrictions on travel abroad that were applied to them, how effective those restrictions were and how the people you study managed to evade them? Thank you. I love the question. This is really fun to talk about. Um, it, the, to make a long and complex legal question uh, short and sweet, in general, it is illegal to immigrate from the Russian Empire. You need to get all kinds of legal paperwork, go to the police to prove you're not a revolutionary, pay a massive amount of money to even get a foreign passport, and immigration itself is illegal. The one caveat here is that um, Jewish immigration does become legalized um, in the 1880s and 90s, actually as a result of the imperial state's anti-Semitism. There's an effort to kind of just get Jews out of Russia. Um, and this is done through colonization societies primarily. So that's a, a small caveat. Um, but in short, that even when Jews can immigrate legally, actually, it's very, very expensive to do so. So many end up doing so illegally. So about 95% of these travelers uh, cross the Russian border illegally. And they do so using many of the same methods that people use today. They um, swim across rivers in the middle of the night. Many turn to smugglers. There are very intricate networks of smugglers and safe houses that, that get people through. Um, but many immigrants talk about this in a lot of detail because it's, you know, the, these journeys are very harrowing and also very interesting. So to give you just two other examples of tactics that people used, um, Heim Weizmann actually talks about this and the way he got out of Russia. He was working for a raft company and um, at this, the Polish city of, it's now the city of Chowun in Poland. It was the, the border with um, Prussia at that time. He was in the middle of the river and he just jumped off the raft and, and swum and ended up on German territory. And there he was, that was, that was how his immigration began. Uh, there's also a great story from Rosa Luxemburg. Rosa Luxemburg escapes Russia uh, buried under um, heads of cabbage in a cart. And this is how she passes the border. So there's a lot of um, efforts on the parts of the Germans and Austrians to um, you know, catch these Russians crossing the border illegally. They don't want them crossing either, but many of them get through. And this is the, this is the story of immigration that we're still sort of like thinking through and dealing with today. Excellent. Um, so Peter Holquist uh, writes, hello, Faith. Fascinating. Um, you stress the interfiliation of ideology and lived experience, the attempt to live utopia, especially as regards gender and gender roles. Of course, there was a past history here, the role of the idealists of the 1830s uh, mm -hmm. and 40s, emigrates themselves, who tried to live new gender relations mm -hmm. in the claustrophobic mm -hmm. hothouse conditions of immigration. Did your immigrant communities reflect back uh, at all on their experience of previous generations. Yes. Hi, hi Peter. It's great to, to see you um, virtually. Um, and yes, actually the book, so the, the subtitle is 1830s to 1930s and that the 1830s and the idealist generation, um, the Poles, but also Herzen, Bakunin, etc. This is, of course, the natural starting point of the story. And I'm interested throughout in the ways in which um, there are continuities, but also disjunctures. So yeah, a lot of these immigrants think back to that previous generation. Um, many of them are, of course, particularly interested in Herzen, who, who looms large among these revolutionaries of the late 19th century. Um, but what I argue in the book is that um, these emigres who of this more sort of radical generation that begins in the 1860s, where again, this gender theme is a huge theme in the 1860s. Um, and I should also mention actually what gets these colonies started as, as communities is actually these female students, female students going to study abroad in the 1860s when the Swiss universities co-educate. And this is what makes their story somewhat different than those earlier generations where it's not a republic of letters, it's actually a community of people living in close proximity. Um, but that radical generation and those radical women in particular 
are very aware of the failures of that prior romantic idealist generation and the ways in which um, their efforts to redefine gender roles and family and sexuality abroad essentially failed. And so this, this guides their, their search for more, um, more radical solutions, but certainly they're in dialogue with previous generations and it's something that they're sort of interested in and thinking about all along. Excellent. Um, we've got a lot of great questions coming in. I'm going to jump around a little bit. Uh, Jessica Kurzain asks, uh, to what extent uh, were these organizing efforts based around Russian revolutionary ideas oriented towards re Russian revolutionary politics versus local British, French, or American politics? Mm. Um, a great question too. Uh, what's remarkable about, about these communities, so I talk about later how they get involved in the European scene, but what's most remarkable to them is how um, how really exclusively focused they are on the Russian setting. It's really only later and kind of by happenstance that they gain this, um, that they become more interested in, in Western Europe. And insofar as they become interested in Western European politics, actually the way they get there is by thinking through the Russian case. So um, to give you an example, um, one of the things that my immigrants are very interested in is the problem of how to organize a party, right? This is impossible in Russia where there's such police persecution and where sort of any form of mass politics is illegal. But one of the things that they're looking at abroad is what people do there. Um, so they're watching, for example, the, the German Social Democratic Party and they're quite astonished at what they can do. They're hanging out at workers clubs in Switzerland and are watching them stage strikes. Um, and they're writing very intelligently um, also about sort of the failures of these movements, you know, where strike, what allows a strike to succeed, what allows a strike to fail, how could we apply this in Russia? But they're interested in these questions prim really only exclusively because they're, they're thinking of doing it better or at least exporting it, translating it in a way um, that can sort of lead the revolution in Russia. So this is one of the funny things that happens when my when my characters return in 1917 because they've been so intently focused on Russia for so many years, but in fact, they, they really don't know what Russia is anymore if they've been away for 40 or 50 years, right? They're, they're experiencing it through this trade in books and literature, um, but in terms of the, the political scene, it's just, it's really different. So this is one of the really interesting, um, I guess, mismatches that, that we, we see here. Um, but I guess I will say this, the story does become more internationalist and more internationally connected as it goes on. That has something to do with the creation of the second international and just the rise of you know, international leftist movements. But it also has a lot to do at the end of the story with the first world war, which I had to totally elide in my talk, but it's a crucially important moment, um, not only in defining the future of these communities, but also in defining the future of Bolshevism. Again, I just had to, to sort of um, go over that. But this is where we begin to see uh, new reconfigurations where Russians are actually in some cases um, participating in a more robust way with foreigners. So for example, like Lenin's Zimmerwald group has many European fellow travelers who join him in, in World War II, his, World War I, his sort of ultra radical um, defeatist group. Um, but that's really a kind of late um, development in my story. Excellent. Uh, Harsha Ram asks uh, uh, or writes, I am particularly intrigued by your sense of the dialogue that arose in exiled communities between the particularism of subaltern ethno-national mm -hmm. groups on the one hand and the universalism of the revolutionary intellectuals. I'm wondering though how much this is owed to the contingencies of proximity and exile and how much has to do with the inherent nature of multi-ethnic um, empires of Eastern Europe, right? Yeah. Um, so in other words, how much is this is a story of exile communities? How much of it is a story of empire? Or right. Are they mutually defining? Right, it's a, it's a great question. And it's, it's not always difficult to tell. It's not always easy to tell what's what. But I, I guess what I would respond um, to your question is that certainly both elements are there. But I think what is really special and particular about my story is A, the ways in which these ethno-national groups um, that live in close proximity in the colonies. Sure, they, they live in Russia, but um, you know, what are the chances that an Armenian is gonna marry a Jew, is gonna be a landlord to, or a friend of a, someone from Siberia, right? This is the kind of encounter that happens in the colonies. And these are the kinds of dialogues that allow for, for example, this kind of federalist scheming that I've, I've talked about. And there's, these stories are, um, um, of the interactions between these national groups. I go into a lot of detail because they're really, really interesting. Um, but I think they're really contingent, although 
they're contingent on the diversity of the Russian empire, but they're really contingent on this exile space. Um, another example that I'll give is that um, in Geneva, right, there are these in around 1880, there's a huge polemic between um, Ukrainian nationalists, Polish nationalists, and um, the incipient sort of Jewish nationalist or Jewish socialist movement, but they're all um, developing in tandem and in dialogue. And in fact, um, there's this group of Jewish socialists, they print their first Yiddish political pamphlet on the printing press run by the Ukrainian nationalist Rachmanis, um, even as they're sort of polemicizing against him. So it's again, this enmity, but this cooperation. And I think both elements of that are really necessary to this story that such different people are living in such close proximity and become so entangled with each other. Um. Leah Feldman asks uh, or writes, uh, thank you for this fascinating talk. I wonder if you could say more about the material conditions that enabled the formation and sustaining of the colonies. Mm -hmm. How was land and housing acquired? How were social structures organized? In what mm -hmm. way does thinking about the colony resonate and diverge from uh, commune imaginaries? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so again, looking at this incredibly rich history of these places, you know, the amount of publications that they produced and these artifacts that they've left behind that have left this wonderful source space for me to work with. It's astonishing because they lived in just really extreme privation. Um, and I should also mention that they were constantly peripatetic. I mean, these people were moving, not even yearly, but often monthly. They were sort of always on the run from the landlord who they hadn't paid, who evicts them and this kind of stuff. So um, they were living with a great deal of precarity. The way that they get through, um, there are a few, um, People like um, Kropotkin, for example, the anarchist um, who is, of course, a titled prince. Herzen is the same kind of figure. These very wealthy titled people who will um, redistribute their wealth and support um, less fortunate colleagues. But what's most interesting about the story, I think, is that this is not a sort of one-off thing where Kropotkin is very generous and supports his poor friends in need, but that these guys and, and, and women also set up these very sophisticated mutual aid mechanisms. And mutual aid is basically the way that they survive. Um, so they set up scholarship funds to help um, students afford to attend university. Um, they have um, low cost canteens that can um, sort of give people cheaper meals depending on how much money they know they have. So they have these just very sophisticated mechanisms for helping each other and letting each other you know, subsist in these, in these challenging conditions. Um, and these mutual aid networks and sort of informal word of mouth networks are also important because uh, another reason these people move constantly is that political realities change and the legal conditions and where they're living change. So for example, I, I mentioned um, there's a sort of big shift around 1890, particularly in France, um, which had been the major center of immigrant settlement at that point, but this also has to do with the Franco-Russian alliance and the French government becomes much less um, friendly toward these Russian immigrants, at which point many people move on to England um, and other places. And they're able to do so because they have these networks of friends. And you know, when you have to move to London, my friend will put you up in, your, in his flat until you find a, a way to, to you know, find a job that will allow you to survive or get into our mutual aid network. So um, that's essentially how they survive. But they live yeah, in immense precarity. And it's just kind of astonishing what they're able to do despite that. Okay, um, we have a number of questions, but I think we'll have we'll have time for at least one more. Um, this is kind of a comment. Elisa Bemparad uh, writes, it seems that you're arguing that the prominent Jewish story of these communities and the response to their existence planted the seeds for the accusation of Judeo Bolshevism, which mm -hmm. would uh, become so prominent among European anti-Semites in the mm -hmm. early 20th century. And then after the whites uh, emigrates, fled the Red Terror for France and Germany, further spreading the myth of Judeo-Bolshevism. Yes, exactly. And it's it's not only a kind of um, structural um, script that's written here, um, the idea that Jews are radicals who are looking to overturn European values and liberal order. Um, there's actually continuities in personnel as well. So um, one example that I'll give you is there's um, some really horrifying correspondence that I read in the National Archives in London of these um, British officials at that time, um, 1910, 1911, uh, Winston Churchill is the home secretary. And you know, what they're saying is basically this, this scum, this Jewish, and you know, it's, it's explicitly anti-Semitic, this Jewish scum is you know, infesting London and um, we don't want them here. How do we get rid of them? This actually connects then to um, 
the British government's relationship to Zionism and to the Balfour um, moment actually has something to do with this. It's, it's ex discussed very explicitly as a way of getting Jews that are unwanted sort of out of England. Um, but then of course, Winston Churchill also writes this absolutely horrifying op-ed, um, I think in like 1919, about precisely what you're talking about, about the Judeo-Bolshevik threat and the idea that um, you know, these folks are still here and they're still um, trying to tear down our state. So um, there are real continuities there that I would draw between, I, I would say like 1890. It, 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 the, um, the, the discourse really comes up with a kind of anarchist um, fear of the 1890s, but it continues consistently through World War I and then um, the Russian Revolution. Okay, looks like we have time then for one more uh, quick question. Um, this, uh, th the spatial analysis of these uh, exile networks is fascinating. To what degree, if any, were uh, these Russian colonies in contact with people still living in Russia during this period? Mm -hmm. um, so they're, in, they're not in close stated day contact simply because of the time that it takes for communications, right? Um, and they are, there's, I mean, there's telegraphs by the end of the story, telegrams, but they're expensive. And they're of course also surveilled extensively by the police in Europe and Russia. So they avoid such things. Um, but they are in pretty close contact through, through literary correspondence, through migratory networks, because almost all of this migration, as I've mentioned, is also chain migration. Um, so if you're from a little town in Belarus, you know, your neighbor's son is gonna come stay with you when he comes to study in Europe. Um, and the other thing that I'll mention, uh, something that kind of surprised me uh, about these communication networks that I didn't expect when I started, but I, I'm including university students, as you noticed in my analytical frame. And it's partially because many of them become radicals and radicalized abroad, but the university students are actually crucial in these communication networks because university students are the, some of the few residents of these communities who are actually able to go back to Russia. They go back for vacation. And they, as long as they're able to kind of, you know, maintain their good, their good graces with the authorities, they're able to go back, tell their friends what's happening in Geneva or Paris, smuggle literature. These female students always go back, um, sew as many illegal pamphlets they can into their bodices, get on the train and go home and then give it to everyone in, in, their, um, in their hometown. So the, the university students are crucial um, communicative um, sort of network in, in, my, in, my, in my story here. Excellent. Um, so just before we, we finish up, I wanted to put in the, um, in the chat the website for the, for the book so that, because you have a really nice uh, website uh, for those who are Thank interested. You. And there's a number of people who were asking about when they could um, access the book and things like that. So that's a, probably a good, good place to, to check. Thank you um, so much. Thank you so much, Faith. Thanks. And I'll, I'll mention one more thing. I'm going to send it in the chat. But um, the timing of this is not ideal. And that, of course, you always want to be a good capitalist and sell your book. The book's not out until April. But if you buy, <laughs> um, there's no reason to buy from the A conglomerate anymore, the A word. We're not even going to say it. Um, but I just want to make sure people know about this bookshop.org, which is wonderful. With COVID, you know, almost all local bookstores will ship to your home or allow you to pick up a bookshop.org does everything that Amazon can do without the gross exploitation and everything else. So please look at them if you don't know them. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. For the Thanks everyone for joining. All right. Bye-bye.